be sufficiently precise to be able to say to say what to do. And of course, their moral foundations are quarreled over uh, endlessly. So um, I'm going to go to the next slide, please. So we're we're in a, a period when we don't really have any um, any moral frameworks by which to figure out uh, what what to do. Um, and that's something I could talk about a very long time, but I'll just leave it there. So, so where are we? Is this is this is from uh, an article by Will Stefan and, and several other people. So, where are we? We're we're in a system where it, a thought system instead of set of beliefs reinforced in many places by by universities, particularly the non scientific dimensions of the university. Um, where we're uh, careening toward a a, a worth a, a, excuse me an earth that is quite possible to be uh, too too hot to live in, and this is really an, an excellent article, and I, I can circulate it later if anybody else would would like it. If you just let me know, uh, so go to the next slide. So what would be what would we have to do to uh, get on track toward the uh, ecozoic? And um, so I'm just again, it's kind of a long list, but I'll go through it quickly. Uh, what, these are the I'm going to come back to each of these things: vertical religions, religions in which the the sacred is somewhere else. The English language is a difficulty. Um, what we study and teach in universities is a big difficulty. The notion of personal sovereignty and the person and the sovereign nation state, also a difficult idea, not difficult to hold up, doesn't doesn't work in some ways. And uh, we also have a uh, pre scientific ethics where we where we think of the the earth as something that offers us services or as a source of natural capital. So if you just keep going on the slides here, I just have little little pictures of various things relating to this list. So Lord's Prayer um, is, is a difficulty looked at from the point of view of, of our current uh, conundrum because the sacred is somewhere else. Right? And, and the earth is in this, in this narrative is, is profaned. Right? Um, so from a sort of, sort of a pragmatic point of view that the, the uh, religions that are um, that are embed, what might be called embedded religions, are much more likely to lead us in a direction that uh, of caring for the earth. I'm not saying that's entirely gone from the Christian tradition, but it isn't. It isn't there centrally. Um, and come come back to the notion that where we live and what we do should be judged by um, sacred, by, by as sacred, and by the standards of the sacred. I'll come back to that briefly. In, in a bit. Okay. Um, so we could go to the next slide, please. Another problem is the English language. Um, so I, I, the only language that I'm proficient in is English. Uh, as I've been around my, my colleagues at, at McGill, um, Colin and Nick, Nicholas Casoy and everything, I, I've realized that I've lived in a prison um, <clears throat> because I, I there, there are many things that uh, 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 um, we're the only subjects, everything else is a thing. And this has profound implications for the way we construct our images and understandings of reality. This is another place where a lot of work needs to be done. The next slide. It's better in a minute though, because Dean is going to take over. It's the more hopeful side. Uh, so, so another very difficult idea in Western culture is is the idea of personal liberty. Um, the the notion the notion is that you can you can do anything you want to do, provided it doesn't harm some harm someone else. Um, but but it becomes <clears throat> um, very 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 difficult to to apply 
uh, because once the car, for example, once the carbon sink is full, there are no examples of actions that we can take that don't harm others. Um, it's, it's also a, a very difficult concept in that it's entirely anthropocentric, right? It's, it's, the other is always another person, right? The, the harm done to animals or plants and so forth is not part of, of the calculation. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> Uh, skip that one, please. It's take too long. <clears throat> just um, okay. So this this is just what I what I just said now that that um, li liberty is understood in North American culture directly violates the golden rule, right? Which which is everyone knows. I, I think is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And in the, the standard operation of a city like Montreal. Paris or anything like that is um, not compatible with with this notion of of uh, the caring caring for the other built into into that moral rule. So so uh, what's what's happening is, is that liberties in way in way that that the, the corona uh, virus is at least indirectly related to climate change and maybe much more than indirectly is a result of the way the, our culture has been set up and, and, and the curse of, of too much uh, cheap energy. Uh, <clears throat> okay, please go to the next slide. Uh, another problem is, is <clears throat> this notion here, we the people, right? It, it's only the, the, the social contract by definition includes only humans. Very for reasons we talked about just a minute ago. Very problematical. Please go ahead. Next slide. Uh, no, great source of, in my view, a great source of the current tragedy is is in the teach the conceptions and teaching of economics. Of uh, uh, this is <clears throat> an image without boundaries. Right? There's no, there's no uh, sense that, that there are any planetary or other kinds of limits on the expansion of, of, the, of the economy. And this, this is a, a, an image used very often uh, in inter-economic textbooks. Okay, another problem is, is the notion that we're the only thinking species. So we can stay with, uh, stay with Rodin, please, for a moment. Let's go back one slide if you can. Yeah, so Rodin's title, a uh, chapter, excuse me, his slide, Eduardo's book, see that that's just not true, right? That, 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 that there, is, there is cognition and, and there's communication. It's ubiquitous in nature. Um, so, so the notion that, that we are special because we we are um, we, we can we can think and speak is uh, an, another conceit that uh, doesn't hold up. So, go to the next slide, please. Um, so, I was wanted to cut. Having been a little hard on religion, I just wanted to say a little bit on the other other side of this um, vast literature and and contentious domain, contentious uh, terrain. So um, religion has been under has been studied scientifically for a long time, at, at least since William James studied it at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, in more recent times, it's been treated more it, religious experience has been treated more scientifically, and it's, I think it's understood at least in part neurologically um, that m many people, um, perhaps almost everybody has religious experiences of this sort where there's a kind of a sense of peace and holism where the where the boundary of the self is expanded and in in these kind of experiences the unity of self and universe is revealed um and the world is is not mine but it's me so that i i think we don't we should think of this as not some sort of a lunatic um uh, meandering but actually as a form of cognition Right? Because in these experiences, 
we can, we have a a clearer a clearer and, and scientifically grounded conception of who we are um, than we do perhaps in ordinary life. So we could go to the next slide, please. And uh, this is long. I'll just I'll just summarize. What this is Einstein basically saying is that you know that that the notion of being a separate person is an illusion. I right? think we're 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 in we're in a sea of of energy and. Uh, um, then this is a, we are um, our principal goal should be to um, embrace the well-being of all living creatures and nature and its beauty. Um, so the next slide, I'm almost at the end here. So the the way to um, think about our place on Earth is, in my view, to to be formed by some art, some work by George Santayana. Where he refers to the sacred as um, as being uh, as reverence toward the source of sources of our being. But that's that's um, so honor your father and your mother, right? Be respectful toward uh, the earth, which enables all of us to live. Uh, respectful toward the sun and so forth. Much much more in the direction of Aboriginal thinking along these lines, thinking and doing along these lines than we do. So um, just end with that. I'm sorry. This is been a little bit long and and at the, the, the um, I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak now next I think Dina will so I've kind of described the problem and Dina's going to describe how to solve it right Dina <laughs> um, well I'm is uh, is it Nick or Carmen who's in charge I just want to uh, check in I want to respect the time for the other speakers um, do I have any time to just quickly talk about how we do the project or? Please take all the time um, that, that you could use. Okay, how much time, how much time do you give me? A uh, good 15 minutes. Yeah, you sure? Absolutely. Okay, I don't, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to bump people off. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing that Nick is going to share the slides that I sent him. Yeah. Correct. I'm yeah. just uh, downloading them now. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So while um, while you're doing that, um, then I'll just uh, um, start by saying that I'm just going to briefly talk to you about how how we have done the project itself, um, how how we um, just basically the mechanics of of how everything that Peter has talked about, how we sort of conceptualize, how, how we work on conceptualizing it. Um, the project itself started in 2014 from a Shirk partnership grant. And that Shirk, oh, lovely photo. Um, that um, Shirk partnership grant allowed us to bring in um, students every year and give them stipends to um, work on their PhD and also be part of the um, E4A project. So in 2014, our project was called Economics for the Anthropocene, which probably most of you know about. And uh, so you'll see in the, the screen at the, the left is our logo, Economics for the Anthropocene. Um, and we brought in a number of cohorts of students and then we um, have now moved into um, a new project, Leadership for the Ecozoic. Um, and so, as Peter talked about in the beginning, we are framing this as from the Anthropocene to the Ecozoic. So we're trying to get out of that, the, the now sort of this negative paradigm of um, the Anthropocene and, and all the pro problematic, it's a pro it's, it tends to be problematic language in a lot of circles. And so we're trying to break out of that and, um, and just forget about all the crap and try and come up with good solutions. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, um, I'll show you the cohorts that we have. Oh, oh, sorry, actually, this is okay. Yeah, so you can go to the next slide. It's just, I forgot what it was. So just to remind you again of what Peter talked about and when we're thinking conceptualizing of the Ecozoic, it's um, thought of as a vision for the future, which is now, um, actually. So we are imagining the Ecozoic now, and we're hoping to 
um, to find even deeper pathways to uh, make it more sustainable, to use a word that Peter hates. Um, so it's a vision for the future founded on mutually enhancing relationships between human societies and the global community of life. So um, we're trying to get out of it being anthropocentric and talking about relationships with all beings. So then the next slide um, just talks about how when this concept first came up through with Thomas Berry and Brian Swim, um, they were talking about the university as being a place where we should train people, um, individuals to think about um, conceptualizing um, something better than just these quick temporary survival fixes. Um, and so that um, is sort of the broad concept of, of, of what we're looking at. So then on the next slide, then you'll see the cohorts that we have. Um, I told you that we started in 2014 as the Economics for the Anthropocene project, and we in, ended up having four cohorts. So we're um, a cohort model whereby we bring students, we accept students into our project um, in, at the beginning of a student um, calendar year, so in September, um, over three universities, York University in Toronto, McGill, and um, University of Vermont in Burlington. And uh, so we did that subsequently 2014, 15, 16, and 17 um, with cohort one, two, three, and four respectively. Um, and then we moved on to um, a bolder, a bolder project, um, leader for leadership for the Ecozoic, where, um, as I described, we're trying to break out of that sort of, um, this is the Anthropocene into let's create something different. Um, and so we currently have cohort um, one. Um, we're, so we've got E4A and Alfari working um, existing um, concurrently because we don't have all of the students graduated from the um, four cohorts. Uh, we, cur we have 53 students who have, um, have been in our program, uh, in our pro both of our projects. We've graduated so far over the three universities, 18 um, students, and we have about 20 that are, um, will be graduating within the year. Um, and they come from a variety of different backgrounds from economics, law, biology, environmental studies, activist backgrounds, uh, physics, psychology, um, geography, philosophy, anthropology. So um, we purposely choose the students so that they would have a diverse background as much as possible. Um, diversity is always something we talk about and we could do a much better job of it. Um, but we're um, constantly um, trying to improve the project and, um, and focus on the diversity aspect. Um, okay, so then the next slide, um, just briefly talk to you about the, um, how we've worked since 2014 is through web-enabled courses. So right now we're on um, Zoom technology, um, but um, back in the day we were using the Polycom system. Um, and so, Basically, you've got um, a cohort of students and they take courses together, but of course they're in three different uh, cities. And so how do you get them to, to connect? And we use the Polycom system and that, although it was cumbersome, um, it worked and people were able to interact with each other and, um, and so forth. And that worked fine until the Polycom system broke down at Mac campus. And so we migrated to the Zoom Zoom platform, and uh, that has been working very well. Um, that worked very well. Um, so we, we did Zoom prior to the rest of the world knowing about Zoom. Um, we've been using it um, pretty heavily for two and a half uh, years at least now, two and a half, three years. Um, and so the courses are two courses uh, where it's sort of in-classroom theory-based um, uh, learning. Then there's a field course where um, students go into the field and um, work on um, a particular problem. So it's really um, problem-based learning. And then what happens is that the, the fourth course is that they come back um, in a year from then 
uh, from when they started and they developed their own course. So there's a student led seminar, um, which really kind of completes the arc of um, their learning and um, gives them training in how to teach each other um, and others. And so um, that's a really cool um, sort of little arc of learning for them. The next slide, I believe, yeah, um, just gives you a little sense of the visiting scholars and invited speakers that we've had um, through the student-led seminars, through um, the course that Peter has taught, um, through our field course, we have had um, a great opportunity to, um, and, and um, we've been very blessed to have a lot of people come and um, give us their, um, share with their, their experience, um, guide us in, um, the, through all of these um, challenging um, concepts. And so we've had everything from active and left as in the um, MGM uh, First Nation in um, Ontario, near to us to a First Nations uh, um, woman, um, an old white man, but he um, is uh, meant to be um, one of the fathers of ecological economics and has been very, um, uh, very generous with uh, his time with the students and um, has um, really um, helped to shape some of the ideas of the students. Then, of course, um, Ellen Gabriel um, uh, came um, in Peter's course. Uh, and so you'll see sort of another smattering of, of different people um, who have come and have uh, participated in the learning for, of our students. So we've been very um, blessed. So the next slide. I think talks about the field courses. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so I did make these slides. Um, so the field courses, uh, I had told you about how each um, group of students comes in as a cohort and they're, they're defined by, um, I mean, not exclusively, but in one aspect, we um, talk about the first cohort as being the water cohort. And what does that mean? That means that um, their field course in the in the first summer of them um, work, um, being in our project, um, the first uh, field course that they do is going to be a field course on water. That was the cohort one, and so they went down to Lake Champlain and um, looked at the um, uh, the problem of um, of um, uh, phosphorus leaching into um, the into, and then they interviewed farmers and. Um, uh, and uh, wrote some papers and such. The second cohort was the energy cohort. And so um, this was um, uh, a number of um, different locations that they went to. We went to the um, Boamwa um, energy plant, um, the hydroelectric plant. Um, we uh, went to windmills and we interviewed a number of people. This is where we met Ellen Gabriel and she talked about, um, we, we went to, um, to um, Oka um, and, and, pl and places like that. So um, that was that. And then on the, set, in the next slide, you'll see that we have cohort three that did a climate justice um, field course. And so they went to Toronto and this is where they met with um, Vanessa Gray who was doing toxic tours of um, her um, um, her land that is right near Sarnia, where um, it's a real tragedy of um, the pollution of um, of, an, of uh, First Nations land. And then uh, cohort four um, went down to uh, UVM and worked on uh, food security, and we were calling it all species food security because we're trying to get out of that um, sort of anthropocentric um, look at, um, you know, what can, what can the land do for people? What can everything do for everything? Um, and then the first cohort of Alfari was the population um, cohort, and they went down to New York City and um, discussed issues of population. So that gives you sort of a, the broad brushstrokes of um, what the students do when they, uh, they come in and the, participate in our project and take the courses. 
Um, let's see what the next slide says. <laughs> Okay, there we go. So another additional part of, of our project, which is very key, um, with the problem-based learning in, with the internship, um, that's one way to actually be on the ground and um, sort of work through and solve real world problems. Another aspect is the internship, of course. And so we have an example, I think it's the next three slides of students who have gone to various internships. So we have people who have gone to um, the UN, they've gone to the World Bank, um, uh, Sustainable Economist um, is, uh, is one of the, um, the places that somebody went to, Capital Institute, um, Next Systems Project. Um, and so, and then, then the third slide is another one. Um, so these are different um, places. So um, just to give you sort of just a, an idea an, a, an understanding of the very different places that people have um, have gone and done internships with, and um, each one of our students um, has done an internship. And then the next slide is a slide to just prompt me to remind myself to tell you that there are a variety of different uh, ways that um, we build community with E4A and L4E, and so one of them is doing the joint courses together, but that's not the only um, the only thing. We have retreats, and so we've had a welcome retreat to um, welcome in the first cohort, the, the new cohort. We've had winter retreats where everybody gets together from all of the different cohorts, um, and so this is um, a photo from the Galt Estate. Um, out in Mont, Mont saint -Hilaire. Um Peter had mentioned the orphan disciplines, and so these orphan disciplines of, um, in particular, there are three of them, economics and finance, um, law and governance, and, um, um, and ethics, ontology. And these three orphan disciplines have um, their accompanying research groups. And so that's another way for students to get engaged and to, um, and to build their sort of career community, um, as it were. Um, and there are many, many other opportunities um, that, that uh, our project um, enables. Um, one that comes to mind, um, Yvonne, um, is on this call, and um, we uh, um, match in community building and, and um, um, you know, finding connections. Um, slide, Nick. Oh. Uh, an economist at the Bank of France, um, a spatial econometrician at the World Bank Group, um, and so on and so forth. Um, the um, economist at uh, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources is also a very um, notable one. Um, we're quite proud of the fact that we have students that are going in places that are um, a little bit more sort of um, middle of the road um, and coming with their own um, broad um, ideas. Um, and so for more information, you can go to our two, um, our two websites and there's my email address. Um, and just to end on the fact that our project is continuing to, continuing to evolve and the l students that we have right now um, are really helping to broaden the vision um, and mandate of um, our project. Uh, we're trying to break out of the, um, the, you know, the paradigm or the, the, the model of the university and the way I've described it seems very sort of university like old school. Um, and so uh, we're trying to find new ways to uh, continually trying to find new ways to get students to be more engaged um, and less in the classroom. That's it. Thanks for listening.
Excellent. Thank you very much, Dina. And um, just because we uh, uh, are a bit pressed for time, not no need for anyone to um, uh, to to rush their their talk. But um, we're going to do a question period uh, at the end of the event. Um, we were going to do it uh, in between, but just uh, to, to make sure that everybody has sort of the uh, an equitable amount of time and questions, uh, we're going to move on with uh, Dr. John Galati. Um, so um, so question period will be at the end. So John, um, if you're ready to go. Uh, do you have any slides, John? No, I don't have any slides for this presentation. Of course, we have thousands of slides, but uh, um, you know, quite frankly, I had uh, thought this was an occasion for presenting uh, the uh, the outline of the ICANN project, and I'll do that. Um, we could have, and perhaps in the future, should plan to. Uh, present a substantive research seminar, which um, we I think it, most people would be very interested in. Uh, but this was intended to be basically a 10 minute review of, of the project, the ICANN project. Uh, the ICANN, ICANN means the Institutional Canopy of Conservation, and it's a, a partnership project that involves uh, linking together of several universities across uh, Canada. Um, McGill together with uh, University of Victoria and Carleton. Uh, universities in East Africa, it's an East African oriented uh, program. Uh, that is the uh, Sequoia University in Tanzania and the University of Nairobi in, um, in Kenya. Uh, the project is a partnership with uh, numerous uh, people across um, at least eight sites. In fact, the number of sites have, uh, has expanded. And uh, NGOs that are, are working in particular in, in those areas, uh, NGOs being um, mainly concerned with pastoral land rights and uh, indigenous rights and, uh, and conservation. Uh, the, the project itself has been really animated by the fact that conventional uh, conservation uh, has in the last 20 years been really superseded by another model for conservation and mainly focused on, on wildlife conservation. That is to say community-based uh, conservation, which uh, is, is really intended to bring closer the communities in which wildlife uh, lives to the conservation process. Uh, this of course is, is contrasted to the, the, the sort of state-driven um, fortress conservation in, in which uh, many of the, in East Africa, we have many of the most famous um, wildlife uh, conservation areas uh, are found there uh, with some of the highest biodiversity in, in the entire world. And that would, I would mention the, the Serengeti and uh, Kilimanjaro and Tarangire in Tanzania. And in Kenya, I would mention uh, the Masai Mara National Reserve, uh, Ebbeseli, um, the uh, and many others. In fact, most of the of the uh, fortress conservation uh, entities were created between the the 1950s and the uh, 1970s, uh, taking areas out of lands that were belonged to the rangelands, forest and uh, and grazing areas that were uh, occupied by. Uh, mainly pastoral communities. So our work has been primarily with, with herding communities that use this land. It really is their land. Uh, and it's been examining the conditions of, of land tenure shifts, uh, changing systems of, of land rights, um, alteration of uh, forms of livelihood, um, securing through different forms of subsistence, and of course, the linkages between the, uh, communities and uh, the, the wildlife and these conservation uh, areas. Uh, we find usually co community-based conservation uh, uh, programs or con conservancies being created in communities that are in the periphery of the, of the fortress conservation uh, sites. And so there, there are a number of very key uh, elements and questions that we've tried to, uh, to address. Uh, one is uh, 
what is the, is there a, a formula that would help us define whether a conservation or a project or a conservancy is, is successful? And uh, that can be addressed both through the issues of uh, wildlife um, sustainability. It can also be looked at from the perspective of the community and their quality of life, including subsistence and incomes. And uh, I think very importantly, their sense that this is something that they have ownership for, that they themselves are engaged in an enterprise that they respect and, uh, and appreciate. And so we have these, uh, these different dimensions, which go right from the economic uh, livelihoods, uh, economic aspects of the linkages to conservancies, uh, the political dimensions of, um, of uh, land rights, the um, uh, really cultural or ontological dimensions of philosophies of conservation and uh, uh, the perspectives that people have in terms of their own identities. Is this something that they are bound up with that is intrinsic to their uh, sense of, of well-being or, or not? Is it an alien force that in fact they're in contention with? And we, we find all kinds of elements which are, are, are quite, uh, quite interesting. So we've been looking at uh, a number of different sites. Um, and we have two elements, uh, two very important elements. Um, one is work that, uh, that uh, Dr. Jacques Pellini has been carrying out uh, in partnership with uh, a number of NGOs and, and, the different, and in different sites where they are, uh, they are rooted, uh, examining, carrying out uh, research uh, uh, programs that uh, link together uh, McGill undergraduates. We've had a whole series of uh, interns uh, each year, about six interns have been going to East Africa. And, and working in some of these sites, in particular with three of our, our key NGO partners. Uh, graduate students, uh, and I'll discuss their work in a, in a moment. Um, the, the partners who are on the ground, and then uh, McGill researchers, uh, and most importantly being Jacques Bellini, who is the, the major uh, research associate and full-time employee on the, on the project. Uh, I've asked Jacques to present something of his work, in a, and I'll, I'll call on him in a, in a moment. Uh, if we go back to the, uh, the, the, the doctoral and, and master's uh, student uh, work, uh, let me just do a sort of a shout out um, with regard to a number of them. Um, we, we have the work by um, Stephen Moiko looking at the inclusion of conservation in common or, or, or group holdings, uh, in particular with Old Kanamatian uh, Group Ranch. Uh, Kathleen Godfrey has done her master's project on local ontologies of, uh, of conservation, also in Old Karmatian. We, uh, Graham Fox, a PhD student, has looked at how conservation goals take account of the aspirations and economic pursuits of youth. So he worked with, uh, with youth uh, across a whole range of, um, of uh, activities and pursuits. Uh, and, and these are mainly people who are local and are somewhat distance from from the pastoral uh, uh, production process, and yet they haven't uh, the education to sort of migrate. And uh, I wish you both for the success of conservation. And Clerkson Lagusa, who uh, was taking his degree uh, through uh, natural resource sciences at, at Mac campus, but worked very closely with us while he was doing his study of four different uh, conservancies in uh, the Samburu region of northern, northern Kenya, in particular looking at the, the community partnership uh, investor relationships and how the governance of conservancies uh, were, uh, were being carried out uh, and, and looking as well at some of the shortfalls of the, in terms of the community feeling that, uh, in, in fact, they were included, but in fact, they weren't really central to uh, decision-making regarding the conservancies. Um, 
the governance role of women in conservancies is being examined by, uh, by Beatrice Lampira doing an M MA uh, project uh, in, in Laikipia, which is also in northern Kenya. And her work is, is just beginning. Um, of course, she's facing many different uh, problems of actually launching a field project during uh, the COVID uh, crisis. So this is sort of a, a, an open question as to how she, in fact, will make her, uh, her way. Um, these are, uh, and then there's the work of, um, of uh, Kariuki Kirigia, um, who is working in the Maasai Mara region, looking in an area where land rights had not been uh, well defined, looking at the subdivision of this area just to the east of the Maasai Mara National Reserve. Uh, and he's at the same time looking at how they're collaborating in and, uh, and struggling with regard to land subdivision, but also the emergence and development of a con con uh, conservancy. Uh, he, he raises the very interesting question, are conservancies more successful when a small group of people essentially grab hold of them and take it out of the community domain uh, and then link up with an investor, or when all members of community retain uh, a right or a share in the conservancy. And uh, this is uh, for looking at the variety of, uh, of experiences in uh, Narok district, which is where this work is going on. Uh, th this I think is, is, is a very intriguing uh, question that we hope to have a, at least some sense of uh, an answer soon. Uh, this is Kenyan work. Um, I, I haven't mentioned uh, Roguet's work, uh, Salau Roguet, who's doing his uh, PhD at, uh, at Carleton. But he's examining an area where you've had a major international project uh, focused on uh, solar, uh, sorry, um, geothermal power, which has displaced a community and basically undercut their desire to, uh, to create uh, several conservancies in the area. So this is sort of high politics, uh, linking World Bank, uh, national interests, local elites, and then local communities. Um, uh, we, look, we look forward to the uh, uh, unfolding of his thesis as uh, he's very close to, to completion. In Tanzania, we've had work in Loliondo, which is up in the north on the Kenyan border, uh, looking at the relationship between villages and villages there are, are um, governance entities. Um, they're, they're not just sort of local um, places of habitation. Uh, looking at the relationship between villages, which are controlled by communities, uh, investor groups, in particular an Arab consortium, that has been uh, taken over a large area, and then the role of government. So the these uh, the, the this sort of uh, multiple uh, uh, stakeholder relationship is something that is especially as interesting in this area and important uh, because the government has at least at different uh, aspects of the government have tried to push Maasai aside so they can give even more of the land over to investor groups. And so this has become a, a, a local, national, and even international uh, source of contention and high politics. Uh, also in uh, Tanzania, we have the work of, uh, of Corey Wright uh, from our department, looking at community government co-management of a wild mat life uh, management area. And in particular, what, uh, what his work looked at was the a struggle over an investor group that was brought in by the community, but then sort of uh, saw itself as independent and didn't follow through on the sort of expectations that communities had. And the community, in fact, in those areas uh, feels very much uh, 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 that they have ownership of this process. And so you have a, uh, a political conflict that is now in the in the, in the courts of, of uh, Tanzania. And then uh, finally, let me mention the, uh, the work by Justin Raycraft. He's uh, just back from Tanzania 
and he's been looking at various conflicts and uh, and collaborative aspects of land use in a, a wildlife uh, corridor that links the, the Tarangiri National Reserve to uh, to the Manyara area. It's a very crucial crucial region and. Um, we look forward to the results of his work as well. And some of the people are here in this uh, um, in this Zoom, so I hope they'll they'll come in and tell us something about their their work as well. Um, so I reviewed the, the the graduate student uh, work, each one of which is a rich and and full uh, project. Sometime in the future, it may be interesting to have, as I say, an actual research seminar that we should convene where we would go into greater depth with regard to each of these uh, projects. Uh, now, let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. Jacques Pellini, uh, who is going to present something about the work that he's done, which is really a, a stitching together of a perspective on many of these sites uh, in collaboration with our, our uh, partners, uh, university and local partners in East Africa. Jacques. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, just uh, how much time do I have? Just so that I can adjust. It would be snapshots in any way, but. Okay, um, anyway, let's. I'm, I'm let's not sure who is going to tell, give us that answer. Yeah. Five minutes would be fabulous. Okay, okay, let's go five minutes. Thank you. Okay, so the, the research I conduct from, uh, for ICANN, contrary to the PhD student research or the graduate student research, is uh, across sites. Uh, so basically, it's really snapshot on different topics and many sites. Uh, but in that way, I try to make the link between the various research which are conducted. Uh, so I'm going to list very, very briefly uh, the key findings from those uh, comparative studies. Um, one is the fact that um, uh, the, ch the challenge in East Africa in pastoralist communities today is not only to conciliate uh, pastoralism and conservation, but uh, new land news are arising. Uh, Maasai people are more and more doing farming and also in certain localities uh, adopting um, more intensive uh, livestock systems, fencing the land and making ranches. Uh, and so one of the findings is that those represent really new challenges for conservation because farming and ranching are associated with uh, fencing the land. Uh, so those are new challenges that uh, the conservation community is going to have to address. Uh, a second uh, important finding is the fact that um, um, land degradation is uh, happening in uh, many, many different places. Uh, but uh, it may have some uh, U-shape, uh, uh, it, it, there may be a recovery after a while, and also land degradation is often accompanied by a stratification of the society, uh, because once you don't have enough resources for everybody, uh, a few manage to still have large herds, whereas the majority uh, has very few livestock. Uh, and so uh, this stratification occurs together with the increasing scarcity of resource. But after a while, it seems something seems to happen and those uh, tendency reverse. You have environmental recovery and you may have also a return to a more equalitarian society uh, after a while. So I think that's uh, something we will have to look more closely in the future. But it's the pattern that emerged from that comparative study. Um, Another important finding is that uh, governance institutions are collapsing, and this happened in that context of uh, degradation of the land. Uh, it seems that uh, we reached the point in many places where uh, um, um, governance institutions uh, fail to manage the resource in the sense that even if they were using optimal management, uh, there will not be enough resource for everybody because it's too scarce. So that means that the, the, the management system becomes uh, insufficient or maybe obsolete. And then in that context, many things happen, including free riding. But uh, one of our findings is that free riding actually appears to be an adaptive mechanism in that context, in the sense that when the collective institution fail uh, to, to 
when the collective rules will fail, even if they were respected to provide enough resources for the community, this is when those rules then are broken. And they are broken actually for a good reason because uh, they could not anyway uh, sustain the people. And, and since new rules cannot be designed, you need a trial and errors and breaking the rules through free writing is actually a way to break the rules. And after a while, new rules appear, emerge out of those free writing behaviors. Um, and the last uh, finding, and this relates to um, one of the uh, key objectives of ICANN, we have to identify uh, optimum uh, community uh, conservation approaches what works best. Actually, we could see two models that emerge, one on communal land and one on private land. So on communal land, it seems that the, uh, the, the, the best outcome is obta obtained when, you, when we have the chance to have a, a strong community which is educated enough to uh, manage by itself investments and even to proceed to investments. So there is at least one case like that in Kenya where the community own and operates the lodge. It's an high hand lodge on the land, on the community land. And in that way, it can really capture most benefit. It doesn't go to foreign investors. Uh, and this is uh, apparently the most successful um, community conservation story that we have seen. And, and then the second model appears on communal land, on, uh, sorry, on private land. So on private land, we have landowners which group into association and then as a group, they individually lease the land to an institution which they control because they created themselves. That institution then establish a management contract with an investor to establish a conservancy on that land. So the land is actually uh, owned by individual owners. And because of that, uh, every member of that organization can receive a cash payment directly on the individual bank account. And then they avoid the problem of resource capture by elites. If you cannot trust your elites, you better receive the money directly on your account. And this is what happens. Now the question is, can this happen on communal land? Uh, at the moment, we only see, only see this happening on a, on a, commun on a private land and it enable a very, very significant increase in terms of the amount of money that the community can capture from the investors and also in terms of uh, right to uh, access this land because in those conservancy where this model happens, basically all the land can be grazed by the community. So they find a way that the tourists and the livestock can cohabitate with proper management. Okay. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, if we have time, uh, I'm still here for questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, John and Jacques. Um, and we'll, we'll go over to questions at the end. But uh, for now, if, if Dr. Uh, Colin Scott would like to uh, speak, and then uh, we can go back to you. Um, thanks, Nick. Um, I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief here. Um, so I'd like to ha hear some uh, reaction as well from uh, Vivian and Stephen. Um, <clears throat> we've uh, maybe bitten, bitten off a little more than uh, uh, it, <laughs> it turns out to be uh, practical given the time and some of the technical diffic difficulties at the beginning. So um, I'll, 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 <clears throat> I'll keep this short. Um, but just to just to mention that uh, there are elements uh, coming out of the um, uh, the presentations from uh, from Peter, uh, from Dina, uh, from John, uh, from uh, Jacques, um, that um, uh, we've we've not made entirely explicit uh, connections between these projects, but the but the idea was to to look at um, um, uh, approaches to uh, pedagogy that are involved in these respective projects, um, uh, E4A, L4E, uh, oriented uh, uh, very deliberately to remaking uh, 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 advanced education uh, training um, uh, through a rethinking of, of uh, conventional uh, academic approaches. 
uh, and you'll see uh, and you'll have noticed in both uh, Peter's references to some indigenous authors and uh, uh, Dina's references to uh, guest speakers that um, indigenous leaders have and intellectuals have been um, a part of that conversation. <clears throat> and then the uh, you know idea was to plan was to pan to uh, work that is being done uh, on the ground uh, by anthropologists and um, uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, teams with with whom we are engaged. <clears throat> so I'll just say a few words about um, about uh, how some of these things are are, are coming together in Sakata. Um, the Center for Indigenous Conservation and Development Alternatives, where we uh, approach concepts of the ecozoic, the pluriverse, um, and decolonial epistemology uh, from the vantage points of, of projects with over 30 Indigenous peoples globally, from the Americas to Africa to Asia to Oceania. Um, <clears throat> Projects participating in Cicada include E4A uh, and L4E, uh, as well as ICANN, the Institutional Canopy of Conservation in East Africa. Um, or who, um, from whom we've just heard. <clears throat> and one of our key organizational alliances that I'll also mention is the ICCA Consortium of indigenous peoples and local community conserved areas and territories. Rather complicated phrase, but uh, that consortium leads a global movement for the defense and renewal of, of territories of life. And this is terminology <clears throat> that has evolved, been developed by and is now preferred by consortium members when referring to uh, their protected and conserved areas and territories. These are all uh, community-based and inter-community-based initiatives. And a number of consortium Indigenous members are also uh, members and partners of Sakata and Sakata researchers. Um, so <clears throat> the social reproduction of territories of life uh, necessarily involves pedagogies appropriate to uh, what has come to be thought as a pluriverse, a, a, multiplic a multiplicity of worlds, our planet's biocultural diversity and defense against uh, cascading ecological deterioration. <clears throat> when um, De Sousa Santos refers to the end cognitive empire, this evokes the manifest failure of Western centers of elite learning and policy not only to uphold human justice uh, or to withstand the myth of progress uh, and conventional development, but to nurture also complex relationalities beyond the human. Uh, so what then does an alternative genuinely decolonial pedagogy toward the ecozoic uh, look like and, and toward some reconciliation of these categories of the pluriverse and, and, and the ecozoic. And <clears throat> I noticed that one of the, the, the participants uh, today, uh, uh, Ivan has, has written explicitly uh, about this uh, reconciliation of terms. Uh, these are matters that we're only just uh, getting our heads around in relation to um, the indigenous partners in our research. Uh, but three elements at least are clear. Uh, one is that the ability of universities to offer leadership of any kind uh, will depend on reinvention of disciplinary and interdisciplinary perspectives of the kind that, that Peter and Dina have, have, have discussed. But <clears throat> this reinvention must be in profound relationship with those who dwell in territories of life and take responsibility for territories of life those who understand and uphold the complex relationalities of their home places. Uh, second, if leadership emanates from any centers, it must be from the multitude of territories of life. Uh, that's where leadership must be centered uh, intellectually and politically. And the ontogenetic processes 
uh, including the collective life projects of those who dwell uh, in those territories of life. <clears throat> so this must include a range of voices um, that we do not typically hear, um, uh, even uh, uh, um, categories of, of actors um, who uh, um, are missed, uh, la largely missed in processes of indigenizing the academy, for example, or decolonizing the academy. Uh, we must go much further to genuinely decolonize the academy. Uh, bringing me to point three, which is our, our interdisciplinarity must become trans or inter epistemic. Uh, learning and guidance must be taken from community leaders, knowledge holders across genders and generational cohorts in Aboriginal or in Indigenous communities on territories of life. How then uh, can uh, we decenter the university? Uh, how does some sort of trans transformation toward pluriversity uh, occur um, uh, necessarily through conversations that transcend con conventional institutional procedures, uh, authoritative uh, genre, uh, and uh, the uh, circles of inclusion, uh, exclusion, uh, involved in, in uh, elite knowledge formation. We in anthropology have long, <clears throat> have long played roles of, of cultural translation and brokerage, but these clearly in themselves uh, are not nearly enough. Um, <clears throat> and um, I'd like, uh, while there's still uh, some time remaining, to call on, uh, on Vivianne Weitzner, uh, who's a postdoctoral fellow, and. Uh, and Stephen Schnur, a research associate with Cicada, to give uh, just some flavor of, of uh, the ways that we are working uh, in Cicada in a couple of uh, other projects. We, John has already described and Jacques uh, described what uh, some of what is being uh, done in uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, but Vivian uh, works uh, in, uh, in Colombia and Stephen uh, principally in Mesoamerica uh, with some work, uh, more recent work as well in, <clears throat> in the Southern Cone of, uh, of South America and in, uh, in Southern Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I can manage my own screens here. So I'm um, Thank you uh, for giving me a few minutes to talk about uh, the work that I do in Cicada. Um, I really was just told about this a couple of days ago, so um, I didn't prepare anything formal at all. And I just want to make a couple of comments um, about the work that I've been privileged to be part of. Um, so um, as Colin said, um, I work with indigenous, but also um, black communities in Colombia um, who defend their territories of life. And uh, this has been very long-term accompaniment. I'm going on now 10 years of working with them very closely. Um, and it's been very interesting because we work in an inter-ethnic alliance. We work across peoples, um, sharing strategies for territorial defense. And um, so um, as part of the work that I've been doing, um, I've been looking very much at the intersection of law and territorial defense and more appropriately, um, uh, indigenous and ancestral law or Afro law and its encounters with state law um, and how that then plays out on the land. So part of the work that we're doing with Cicada's uh, backing um, is uh, looking at developing indigenous tools in, um, and Afro-descendant tools um, towards um, territorial defense um, that are imagined uh, from a decolonial perspective. In other words, trying to, and this is very, very hard work, how do you, after centuries of having a, an imposition of a different way of thinking, um, you know, um, reclaim um, a vision of law um, that can defend your territories that is decolonized? Um, so I've been doing some work uh, recently with some of the spiritual um, leaders, women, youth, um, and local authorities, particularly in the Resguardo Higiene Caña Momoloma Prieta, um, and uh, looking at their um, protocols on consent, but also, um, you know, other um, land uh, management tools um, 
I wouldn't say land territory management tools that they're putting together, developing uh, to, to use to defend their territories in lawfare with the state. So it's a very interesting exercise and I have so much to talk about that I'm just gonna leave it there. Um, but I just wanted to say that my university has really been working with these people um, and we've uh, generated long-term relations of, of trust where we can co-create uh, where we, I can support knowledge building and also bring in some of my own perspectives and knowledge um, and, and share differences of opinion in a very healthy, I think, uh, what's become a very healthy um, uh, co-production uh, in defense of their territories. And, and, uh, and so it's been 10 years now, <laughs> it'll probably end up be at least another 10 years. So I um, just wanna thank uh, you all for sharing and maybe at a different point, we'll go a bit deeper into some of these these issues. I think there's a lot of sharing with Al Fari and some of the work that you're doing there and I can as well on, on some of these issues. So I'll let Stephen say a couple of words about what he does. Uh, thanks Vivian and a and, uh, big thank you to the organizers of this uh, really interesting um, panel um, and to the presenters. Uh, I'm cognizant of the time. I see it's uh, under 20 minutes left. So I'll try to keep this very brief um, uh, to leave some time for Q and A. Um, but in line with what Colin was saying about um, Cicada's work of thinking deeply about sort of pedagogies of decolonization and what does that actually mean in tangible terms on the ground and the work we've been able to do. Um, personally for me uh, as a research associate with Cicada and formerly a postdoc with Cicada, uh, it's been kind of a, a privileged opportunity to continue work that I was uh, doing research in my doctoral work in which I was working primarily with mining affected communities in Central America and Guatemala and Honduras um, that were resisting unwanted Canadian mining projects on their territories, uh, metal mines for the most part, which were having enormous consequences of the type that uh, uh, you know, Peter, and, Peter and Dina have talked about in terms of you know, ecological despoliation that were sort of celebrated by really dominant hegemonic tropes. So I was able to sort of think through some of these like dominant discourses like democracy and development that were really advancing some of these really contentious projects that were causing so much harm. And uh, in the work that I was doing as a doctoral student, I was sort of mapping out the politics of resistance. What happens when indigenous communities get together and say, that's not what we mean by, by democracy. That's not what we mean by development. In fact, your version of development is causing so much harm and destruction. Um, and through Sakata, I've been able to extend that line of kind of, uh, you know, investigation to that form of perverse advancement of really destructive regimes of so-called development by thinking through how that also operates in the realm of indigeneity. Uh, and, you know, taking a cue from some, some really articulate and clear thinking uh, Canadian-based indigenous scholars, Glenn Cooktar, Ty Alfred, uh, Van Simpson, who've really kind of incisively argued how it discourses of indigeneity and indigenous empowerment, self-determination, anti-colonialism can actually quite insidiously and pretty perniciously form the core of contemporary forms of what Coulthard calls misrecognition through which really grossly inequitable colonial practices and political and economic relations actually come to be stabilized in the name of decolonization. Uh, and, and I've sort of thought through uh, you know, some of those problematics in, in other work, which I, I won't go into now, but, but, but looking sort of very briefly at how Canadian mining companies have kind of strategically tried to cultivate Indigenous subjectivities, Indigenous epistemologies, as a way of um, cultivating subjectivities that would co-opt their aspirations for what we're calling decolonization or self-determination or demands for recognition of indigenous rights and then channel that energy into supporting, in fact, demanding the very model of extractive capitalism that Canadian mining regimes are wishing to develop all over the region uh, to some really deleterious effects. Uh, you can imagine the conflict that, uh, that ensues on the ground. So speaking in tangible terms, um, the work that I was able to do over the past 10 years or more is working with these affected communities with video. So I started uh, videography, you know, as a documentarian, working with these communities to, uh, to sort of broadcast to the world as best I could what was actually happening on the ground in terms of these so-called development projects uh, and allowing community voices, which were otherwise unheard, to be able to reach larger audiences. Through that, I began to sort of donate equipment, fundraise, and then I met up with Colin several years ago 
uh, and began working with the visual methodologies axis of Cicada in which we uh, contribute uh, visual equipment, cameras and laptops and cell phones to affected communities that are defending territory, defending livelihoods, defending their cultures. And we use these tools and, and I offer workshops on how to use them um, as means of, of pushing back, as a means of pushing back against this dynamic that I've just touched upon. And so um, elsewhere, and, and there's really not a lot of time to go into it now, but I can point anyone interested in some publications where I've tried to think through these, these problems. Uh, I've tried to sort of think through, and in my work as well with Sakata leading these workshops, as Colin mentioned, mostly in Mesoamerica, but also a bit in Southern Africa, how can participatory video, communities getting together with these tools, how can, they, how can that process be used as an engine of resistance, of reimagining, of real decolonization, advocacy, community development that comes from the ground up, that is imagined on their terms and their uh, conditions? using video and videography as a tool of decolonization to kind of counteract what I think is fair to call what I've just termed to sum it up as a kind of psychological violence. Um, and, you know, we're working with, with partners all over Latin America and Africa who are facing very different specifics, but which, which have quite a strong commonality in the form of this kind of perverse exploitation that I was just talking about. Um, and so the task at hand for a lot of Cicada partners really is about uh, cultivating the narratives that allow them to sort of, you know, galvanize community resistance and fortify, celebrate their, their ways of being that allow them to defend uh, conservation, to defend territory, to defend livelihoods and lives. Um, that's sort of a mouthful and, and I'm cognizant of time. We've just, you know, over 10 minutes left. So I think I'll leave it there. But of course, welcome any questions uh, that, that uh, may provoke. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, Viviane, and Colin. Um, so we'll open the floor, uh, virtual floor, to some questions. Um, you can either raise your hand, send a message, or just unmute yourself and um, speak. I'll be uh, surveying the landscape to uh, see if there's any, anyone who's waiting with a question. Um, And of course, it's a, an open question period for uh, all speakers, as well as discussion. I wouldn't mind uh, asking a question or comment, uh, Nick. Sure, go for it, Justin. And then Peter, I see you have your hand up. So we'll go Justin, then Peter, and then maybe uh, Anne. Yeah, it's not really a, a question, actually. It's more of a comment. But so John uh, mentioned my work briefly on the ICANN project there. Um, and one of the themes that's sort of been coming up in my work is moving away from critique of conservation and fortress conservation and kind of trying to think more productively about solutions to very complex social ecological problems. Uh, and working with various stakeholders, a lot of whom are conservationists. Um, yeah, so so I kind of wanted to to mention that just to sort of say that it's it, it's not so much this kind of fortress model that's kind of dominating the rhetoric um, these days. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Peter. Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself so just click um, either at the bottom left of your screen or great okay we're good sorry about that this isn't really a question either it's just to uh express extreme um thanks for being invited into this conversation it, it's unbelievably rich it joins what we're trying to do in, in many many ways that will will advance uh, what we're trying to accomplish which i think is very similar to your, your overall goal of this group so um thank you so much all right, thank you, Peter. Um, Anne, you had a question. Uh, are you talking about me, Anne Snick? Yeah. We, Anne, uh, yes. Okay, I put a question in the in the chat. Uh, 
I'm, I'm working in Europe uh, at university trying to foster you know, the transition from human centrism to ecocentrism, but we don't have a beautiful program like you guys are. I'm just absolutely jealous. And we also don't have in, you know, First Nations or indigenous communities really here. We have lots of migrants, but that is a kind of a different story. And I experienced that it takes my students about a year to sort of like unlearn, you know, the, the whole human centrist narratives. So I was just curious to, to know how, how many, how much time does your leadership for uh, ecozoic uh, time, uh, how much years do they do they put into that? Because we just put, make it a, we make it a honors program because that, it's like a little corner of the curriculum where you can pretty much do your own thing. But of course it doesn't, it's not like the same impact. So I'm just curious how, how many years your students take to really reach that re amazing result. Thank you for sharing that by the way. So I can answer that question. So a student um, would uh, apply to university. Um, so in this case, it's McGill and they get accepted and they start with um, the Elfery project um, when they begin their university um, uh, training. And the courses themselves take a year and a half, but uh, we kind of consider that they are lifers in a way. So um, when they start with Alfari, they continue even um, when they graduate. Um, we're still connecting with them and they're still engaged with us. So um, the course, the courses themselves take a year and a half, but they continue to be engaged until they finish their um, PhD and then um, continue to be engaged with us after that. Well, that is great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I had a question. There's a... Please go ahead. Okay, okay, sorry. I was just wondering um, whether the, any of the students have chosen to work with people's organizations, um, you know, and um, to what extent there's been um, the opportunity to, um, to, yeah, to intern with, to go visit and be part, you know, to, um, and share knowledge with and participate in, um, you know, indigenous or other people's uh, governance um, or projects or proposals. So, so sort of the other way around uh, in, in a way, I guess. Peter, would you like to answer that question? Peter, you'll just have to um, unmute yourself. Dina, why don't you, you you take the question and then I'll, I'll I'll come in after you. Okay, so well, my um, the the broad answer is that uh, the connection with uh, people's organizations is kind of thin at the moment. With um, uh, in terms of like long lasting relationships, the one the one person that comes to mind right now is Jen Gobby, who has. Um, uh, graduated um, last year, and she continues to um, work with and engage with a variety of different um, uh, organizations. Um, but um, we we have yet to to gain some real traction in that area, whereas we've had people come and um, uh, and uh, you know be part of the the project. But once people leave. Um, there's there's less traction on that, and so this speaks to my um, what I had ended um, my little presentation on was that we continue to um, to envision and evolve as a project, and um, that's one of the things that we would like to strengthen. Yeah, maybe I could also just add a little bit to what what Dina said. Uh, because we're we're very concerned with the pedagogies of dominance uh, that, that are are the source of a lot of these uh, things we've been speaking about this afternoon. We've aimed really at trying to get people um, into positions where the, the standard reasoning uh, does not uh, dominate the the discourse. And and the, the um, one of our students, which is really the the best result we have so far on this, has a uh, a senior position <clears throat> at the Bank of France. And his portfolio is is finance and climate, and he's um, 
So this this is a uh, you know we're, we're hoping that we know already that his work is very impactful because we read it, but also we know we hear from many sources that it's impactful. So we're we're uh, very concerned with revising the, the pedagogy uh, in the academy to feed into it, institutions in society that are very very powerful and often very harmful. Sorry, Colin, you can go ahead. Good, so I wasn't sure if you were. <laughs> yeah, sorry, fell prey um, to my own. Uh... So one of the uh, interesting uh, E4A, L4E uh, graduates are ending up is that, of course, it's a reflection of who has uh, resources to hire people. Um, and, and so to some extent, we're seeing the reproduction of of aspects of a system, maybe less pernicious aspects of the system, but nevertheless uh, still pretty deeply embedded in in mainstream uh, institutions like uh, national banks. Um, tremendous uh, uh, opportunity there in, in, in terms of committed people from within uh, hoping to uh, to convert these institutions, but but for power to be realigned, I think the lessons of from many parts of the world are that without unrelenting pressure from community level people on territories being de defended, there's very little motive or incentive for central institutions to uh, to change. Um, and also that that it's very difficult to reinvent uh, oneself from within. Um, one of the uh, beneficial aspects of the encounter between uh, worlds, um, trans epistemic, uh, um, as between ontologies that, that um, um, are often un mutually unintelligible in many respects and, and perhaps incommensurable, but the, the very effort and, and drive to imagine beyond oneself uh, is, uh, is is a powerful political force and and um, and has a in the context of indigenous activism and I mean territorial territorially gr grounded indigenous activism um, is is that it, it, these are not utopian visions these are lived realities with, that people are creatively exploring ways to uh, to defend and to secure and and to uh, uh, adjust to uh, pressures of of modernity. Um, I might jump in with a question here. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, exciting and inspirational projects we're talking about are uh, already you know sort of well established projects, and sometimes in collaboration with communities who have. Uh, really been taking their own initiative um, to organize. Um, and as a you know, young uh, scholar, uh, I'm just wondering if anyone has any advice for sort of early career uh, scholars who are looking to establish new projects and perhaps with communities um, who do not have yet, uh, who, who do not yet have um, a really established sort of self-organization for, um, for you know, fighting for their territorial rights and their life projects, I, I think of my own context with uh, nomadic people who are um, who have limited uh, and often sporadic access to internet um, in, in in quite a remote area of Mongolia. Um, so just if we don't have much time, but if anybody has any advice for establishing these projects. Uh, Peter, uh, unmute, please. Uh, you're still muted, Peter. Uh, yeah, what, one one thing um, that I think has been not us as individuals, but our project has been very much um, influenced by trying to to not to do everything at once. 
and and to focus on on the, the, the pedagogical issues that are in Western higher education that are that are the drivers of these of the harm that all of us who are probably in this meeting share. Um, so a, a kind of um, a narrowness of and I'm speaking now about the organization, not the person so much, but the narrowness of the uh, mandate in some ways, I think is an, an important thing to establish uh, fairly soon so that there's so many things in the world that none of us like, right? That it would be, uh, you, you can just uh, run yourself and your resources into the ground if you don't have a, bound, a, a conceptual boundary. Thank you. Um, well, we have hit uh, uh, 2.30 or 2.31 now on my clock. Um, so uh, that is the a lot of time. So thank you everyone for, uh, for, for attending today. And uh, again, apologies for the technical difficulties, but thank you everyone for, for your patience and for the collaboration to make this um, work. Um, and so I don't know when this uh, room closes, but uh, I'll stick around at least, uh, you know, until I'm the last one here, but uh, so I imagine we can mingle Thanks, now. Um, Thanks to you, Nick, and to Carmen for uh, for the uh, organizational efforts to bring this together. Uh, huge thanks. Yeah, th thanks to you all for making this possible. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Light crowd. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. And uh, there are refreshments in your own fridge. <laughs> Alan, I had a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, have you, um, um, are you in contact with Mindy? Help me with her last name, Peter. Mindy Clark? With She's in education. education? Education department? No. No. Um, she has a project called Imagining, and, and um, they are kind of reimagining education. And their sort of overarching concept is to unlearn as a way of learning. Hmm. Mindy Clark? Um, I think it's Mindy Clark. Um, and Peter and I attended her, her, her little symposium she had and it was really lovely group of people. Um, uh -huh. I'm just trying to find her last name. Um, Colin, mm -hmm. just while Dean is looking for that, it would be, it would be a good idea if <clears throat> be helpful to us if we could speak <clears throat> later on sometime today, just about, uh, you know, the, the overall issues we've talked about in the last week or so. Yeah, sure. Uh, Mindy Carter. That's Carter, her. okay. Yeah. yeah. Is she on faculty uh, or graduate yep. student? Yep, yep. Uh, no, no, faculty. She's uh -huh. uh, running a, a project um, out of um, education. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, you. Uh, I think we 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 clearly have uh, a lot more conversation. Uh, we may have to schedule sequel events.